Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. Tonight, we learn about the environmental benefits and challenges of finding new uses for historic structures. Also, a visit to one of the oldest neighborhoods in Tucson and what you can expect in our great outdoors this month. But first, here's a look at today's top stories. Governor Jan Brewer announced the formation of a task force today to investigate problems at the state's Child Welfare Agency. Governor Brewer calls the independent committee the CARE Team, which stands for Child Advocate Response Examination. The group, which will report directly to the governor, was formed to oversee the investigation into why more than 6,000 child abuse reports were set aside and not investigated. The team includes members of the legislature, the head of Arizona's Department of Juvenile Corrections, and children's advocates. Clarence Carter, the head of the Department of Economic Security, which oversees Child Protective Services, is keeping his job for now. When asked by reporters whether she still has confidence in Carter, Brewer did not answer. The three Tucson City Council members re-elected last month took their oaths of office today. Tucson City Council members Karen Ulick, Richard Fimbris, and Steve Kazachik, all Democrats, were re-elected this year to serve another four years. After being sworn in, they each say they're focused on making sure the city has enough funding to keep up services in the coming years as the budget tightens. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. For hundreds of years, people have torn down older buildings to make way for chic or modern structures. But a growing segment of our population is asking that we pause and reflect about these actions. They say historical buildings can provide an irreplaceable sense of place and contribute to our environment and culture. Tony Paniagua and photojournalist Bob Lindbergh bring us an example north of downtown Tucson. Adding your shoulders if you can. A decades old building near downtown Tucson is serving a modern day community that is diverse but yet alike in some ways, with a shared appreciation for the environment, education, and the arts. These salsa dancing classes are held at the historic Y, the former YWCA. Good. Now in groups of threes. Melissa Alejandra and her teaching partner, Peter Cipello, are some of the many tenants who enjoy the tradition and the mutual interests. It's like a little golden nugget that's like underneath a little bush or something. And you, you just drive by and it's a nice, you know, it's a nice looking building, but you kind of don't really suspect that there's much. And then you come in here and you're like, wow, there's all this richness. There's so much richness inside, so much. One, two, three. In its previous life, this dance floor was a common area for members or guests of the Y, and the offices of today used to be boarding rooms many years ago. In this case, one of the upstairs rooms has undergone a colorful transformation. It is serving as a studio space for Tucson artist Dinah Jasensky, and the large facility is home to other surprises along the way. If walls could talk, it appears the stories would be endless. Lots of people come into the building, even today, saying they learned how to swim in this building. There was two swimming pools, an indoor and an outdoor pool, which are now covered up, but uh, used for other purposes now. That's it, you guys. Breathe. For Melissa Alejandra, the history and variety of organizations make her experiences more enjoyable. It's interesting because in some way, shape, or form, we're all in, like, in a way, nourishing our mind, our bodies, our spirits. And that nourishment can be quite literal. I'd like um, one effie and one baguette. Philippe Waterings established Tucson Community Supported Agriculture in 2004 as part of a school project. It is commonly called CSA. Well, what it does, it really helps people to gain access to local organic food as well as helping farmers, you know, especially local farmers, local organic farmers in the region. When he began the organization, he would distribute the food from the front porch of the gas house where he used to live, but soon he needed bigger quarters. So he inquired about this building. And uh, when a uh, 
space became available, we just moved in and we've been here ever since. It's a very nice mix. Uh, most uh, tenants here are either on environmental organization or social institutions. And everyone, uh, there's a lot of common spirit. There's a lot of uh, shared values among the tenants here. It makes a very nice atmosphere. Um, it's very pleasant to work here. Uh, the building itself is really, it's a nice place to be in. A lot of the advertising is just through word of mouth. People enjoy being here because of the environment, the sense of community and family. Um, and it just kind of, it all coexists. It all kind of happens. It's a, it's a lot of fun to be around and work with positive minded, positive thinking people. And Melissa Alejandra says that positive energy can be contagious, not just on the dance floor. The enthusiasm and variety of programs, she says, will continue to provide new material to a growing repertoire at this location. Uh, turning to the right. Tony Paniagua continues the conversation now with a couple of guests. Kagan Tom is a local architect and board member of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. Sean Burke is the owner of the Historic Y. Kay and Tom and Sean Burke, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Robert. Pleasure to be here. So we just saw the story about the historic why and how it's being used by many different organizations. Sean, how did you come about this property and what do you want to tell us about the history of it? Um, I came upon the historic why in 2004. I was looking for um, a project. I had bought and sold other properties, um, all residential properties. Um, but I was um, looking for something that was interesting that um, um, I'm, I'm, my background is architecture. I've always been drawn to things that are architecturally interesting, historical properties. Um, and also I've been, you know, drawn to, um, you know, urban centers. And, and uh, I, I like the idea of, you know, doing infill projects and adaptive reuse. And um, it was just by chance that I came upon the Historic Y, actually. It was, it was for sale, and um, it was off of Fourth Avenue, which I thought was this vibrant um, setting in Tucson, and it was just the perfect thing for me. And of course, the Historic Y does have a lot of history. Uh, it's beginning with the architect behind it all. What do you want to tell us about that? Um, it was designed by Annie, Annie Graham Rockfellow in 1930. Um, she was the lead designer for Henry J. Statt, um, who was also a, a, a mayor of Tucson. And um, she uh, was really a pioneer. She was from the East Coast. She was the first graduate of MIT um, in architecture. And she was the first red female registered architect in Arizona. And she designed many uh, buildings um, while working for J. Statt, uh, including El the historic El Conquistador Hotel, uh, which he designed two years before the historic Y, and unfortunately, um, that was destroyed to make room for the Elkhorn Mall. Uh, but luckily, the historic Y was preserved and was the um, uh, Young Women's Christian Association from 1930 when it was built to 1980. And then they, the YWCA decided to build um, a new building and sold it to begin a capital campaign. Uh, it was bought by private investors who converted it to um, an office building. And then I purchased it from them. At the time, it had a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, it was really under leased. And that was my project to uh, build upon what had, what had been started. All right, and we'll come back to you on that. Uh, and Kagan, so you are a board member of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. You are also an architect, mm -hmm. and why your involvement with this organization, the uh, Historic Preservation Foundation? Oh, I really feel that it's important to save historic buildings um, in our town. They bring a lot of culture, they bring economic development, and they're really something that you can't bring back once they're taken down. And um, I'm also on the architecture company. My dad started the company about uh, 30 years ago. and. He, when we were children, he would take my sister and I around all over Arizona to the different historic projects that he worked on. So we really got to see the impact that, that adapting, that adaptive reuse and restoring these uh, historic projects really made for the community and for the people there and from an economic standpoint. 
All right, and you have some pictures of some of the different projects. Let's just talk about one right now, the Curly School Campus in Ajo. What would you say, want to say about that one? Um, that building, it's a beautiful building. It was built in 1919, and right now the International Sonoran Desert Alliance is who works there, and they do... They've, they're doing an amazing job there. They actually have like second Saturday events there if you want to check it out. And um, the the building itself was in, in decent shape, but we really looked at it from a standpoint of how can we improve it from both an environmental standpoint and also from the use standpoint because they were classrooms and now they're being converted into artisan lofts. So they both work there and live there. Um, so from the environmental standpoint, we increase the insulation on the roof to get it to R40, so that's really great. And the the thing with historic buildings too, a lot of the um, buildings are built to be more environmentally friendly. So the, the thickness of the walls, it's from uh, hollowed out clay and then it has furred out stud walls with uh, stucco. And so that in itself provides a huge thermal mass and also a really large insulation value. Um, so with that, we were able to keep the existing windows too, and the local community actually helped to, ins to uh, fix them up and, and put them back in. Okay, and we'll come back to uh, talk a little bit about more projects, but Sean, in the story that we did about the historic Y, of course, we met some of the tenants, and how did you come up with that, or was it intentional? Did it just happen that there were so many different environmental, cultural, educational organizations? And I just should just point out that one of the reasons that I did that story is because I kept calling different organizations, environmental organizations here in Tucson, and they said, oh, we're at the historic right. Y, and it just added up over a while. Right. Um, when I bought the building, uh, there, so, some of the main uh, tenants were environmental groups, and Zuzi Theater was also there. Uh, so the Audubon, Tucson Audubon Society, Sky Island Alliance, um, environmental Education Exchange. And so there was already a, a vibe. Um, it, there was this uh, progressive um, environment there, and, and one related to the arts. And being uh, an architect, I, you know, that was interesting to me. And um, I wanted to build upon that sense of community. Um, and so I just started to put it out there that um, I, you know, had space and it was interesting you know, space, architecturally, historically, um, great location, and I wanted to attract other arts-related organizations, environmental organizations, and education-related or organizations. And I literally, like, picked up the phone and called people I thought were interesting and said, hi, I own this great building. Uh, I'd, would you be interested in me giving you a tour? And I, um, one of the people I met um, uh, were two people who were applying for a charter school. They were applying for their charter. And um, they were, they, their emphasis was um, environmental sustainability and social justice, which f fit into the, my vision. And um, I, we, we got them into the building. And we had to do a major renovation uh, to get them in. But yeah, my history has been finding people who have want to be in a space with like-minded people and making it happen, doing the you know, work and providing the space uh, so that they can do what they do. Okay, great. And then Kagan, let's talk briefly about the, we have a dramatic pictures of before and after on two different projects, the Clark House and the Presidio. The Clark House is in Florence, the Presidio is here in Tucson. What would you want to say about the before and the after of those two? Let's begin with the Clark House. The, the Clark House, yeah, that, um, was built, I believe, in 1884 uh, for a William Clark, and he was a miner, an uh, engineering mine, miner. And um, it was one of the—it's one of the oldest two-story adobe structures. And as you can see in the photo, almost the whole second story has pretty much fallen down. So we worked with uh, the owner, who decided they wanted to put office spaces in there to. Uh, fix everything up. So with the existing adobe, what we had to do is take it and get it, uh, get that material composition of that adobe tested to figure out how much of the different material was in it to recreate the same thing. So that way the building itself can remain standing because if the adobe mixture is wrong, you can start to have issues where it can crack or fall down. So um, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing building and um, the owners really love it. And what about the Presidio, the, the before Presidio, and the after? The Presidio, that one, uh, the neighborhood put out 
an RFP, this was back in the 80s, I believe, uh, where they were looking for a developer and architect and they wanted to fix up this uh, old uh, Sonoran row house built in the territorial style. I believe it was done in the 1900s and um, it's one of the first adobe structures that's actually set back from the street in that area. So the neighborhood really felt like it was important. Um, so we, my father is actually the one who, who developed a plan for it and so what they were able to do is build adjacent homes that um, could relate to it in terms of scale and material, but showed that they were they were newer construction and be able to take the sale of that of those residences and apply it toward restoring that uh, historic structure. So they were able to put the adobe back in, put um, historic windows, rehab the historic windows, and um, and I think it ended up selling. So. Okay, great. And then finally, Sean. So moving forward, what would you recommend to other people who? have the opportunity to, to buy a historic structure and are thinking or are on the fence on whether they should try to save it or demolish it and build something new. If you could just give us a brief synopsis on that. Well, I, th I think that there's a great value to historic buildings. And, and you know, there's at the historic Y, there's really a sense of um, space and, and the, the history adds to that. I mean, people, just say they feel good about being there, that there's a vibe, there's a vibrancy, there's mm -hmm. a vitality there. And sometimes it's hard to put a finger on it, but you know, I think it's a combination of, of the people you know, and the, the architecture, the physical space, and, and, and the history of it. You know, I hear so many stories about you know, people's experience in this building over time and how the building has been changed, it has incorporated uh, different uses. And um, I, I, I think that that really adds to our experience if we retain the historical. Okay, well, Sean Burke and Kagan Tom, thank you very much for joining us and good luck to both of you on your projects. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. All right. The Obama administration says consumers will have an easier time using healthcare.gov now that it's fixed the major setbacks, but insurers warn problems still exist when confirming coverage. The uproar in Ukraine. Protesters who want closer ties with Europe now control a public square in the heart of the capital as they call for the heads of government to resign. And Spencer Michaels profiles David Hockney, the prolific artist who continues to innovate using technology technology to advance his work. Hockney at 76 shows no signs of slowing down and in fact he admits he is working as fast as he can on a wide variety of projects. Those are just some of the stories we're covering on tonight's PBS NewsHour. NPR's Planet Money is undertaking a global mission following the making of a t-shirt around the world. Next stop, spinning the cotton in Indonesia. You have the twist, the amount of twist, the direction of the twist. I'm Renee Montaigne, how to manufacture a t-shirt on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. We've been talking about the societal and environmental benefits of preserving historic buildings as opposed to demolishing them and beginning new construction from scratch. And now we are joined by someone who is very knowledgeable about this topic. Damien Klinko is the president of the board of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. So thanks for coming in today. Thanks so much for having me. So let's talk about uh, the number of historic properties that there are in Tucson. You've got some sense of this, yes? Yeah, so Tucson sort of built in two different very distinct phases. There was a pre-World War II phase and then sort of a post-World War II phase. And that pre-World War II phase, you know, in 1930, the population of Tucson was about 30,000. And by 1960, it was 225,000. So we saw this huge growth. And so, you know, we have this very large post-World War II housing stock um, that really is ripe for uh, retrofitting to make it green. Okay, and we were just talking a moment about some of the differences in the actual building styles and the materials between pre-World War, kind of right after World War, and then what I would think of maybe as the more modern 
of sort of the modern movement. Yeah, so you have these really, so these two different stylistic phases where you have, before the war, you have sort of revival and craftsmanship uh, or craftsman style um, bungalows and, and houses. Um, and you have wood windows um, that are really ripe for, um, for improving to make them more energy efficient. Um, in the post-World War II era, you shift towards more of a, a block construction with steel casement windows, also um, excellent candidates for adaptive reuse to make them more um, energy, uh, energy sustainable in our climate. All right, so this is something I've dealt with. I know people who are dealing with this, windows, let's talk about that for a moment because of course you get one of these older buildings and one of your first thoughts is, I need to put energy efficient windows in here. <laughs> well, architect Carl um, Elephant said, the greenest building is the one that's already been built. And I think that really is, is true when you think about our building stock. You know, the energy that it costs to demolish a building or rip something out of a building, um, it's, it, is, uh, it is counterproductive to actually reinvesting into the, into the, to the structure and into the infrastructure of the building. And windows are a perfect example of that. So if you have a wood window, it has embodied energy in it already. There was the energy to cut the wood, to mill the, to sh ship the wood here, to mill it, to put it together, to actually install it into the home. And windows today are designed with a, with a shelf life of 15 to 20 years. So if you have an old growth wood window that you can retrofit with hard coat e-glass or a dual pane system, um, it's far more energy efficient to do that than to buy a new system that you're gonna have to replace in 15 or 20 years um, and an energy that you'll never recover. And energy efficient on this grander scale, not just at the scale of the house. Not just the grand, not just the scale of the house. Um, Tucson, you know, has really, I think, is, tends to be a progressive community, and we really are looking for ways of making our homes um, and architecture more energy efficient. Whether it's the installation of solar panels, wa solar hot water systems, um, energy efficient windows, um, and, and when you apply that to a single house, but then you apply it over the entire housing stock, I mean, it re represents huge transformative um, energy savings. Well, but let's talk about that for a moment. Um, you know, you're putting solar panels on a historic home, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, it seems like those two things don't really come together. Is so it possible? It is possible, and I think it actually is an opportunity for compatible um, sort of pro progressive energy efficiency. You know, in Armory Park, um, numerous homes have um, numerous homes have um, solar panels, and the city of Tucson has actually adopted standards for the for the local preservation zones, of which there are five in the city, to deal with with solar panels. So. Um, that they don't interfere with the historic character of the home, but still allow the homeowner to take advantage of um, energy efficiencies. All right. Well, as someone who owns a, an older home, I have to do a lot of work on it. So there is a, f a financial component to it. So, you know, talk to me about what it takes then to actually move into, for example, buy an older property and then maintain it or increase the efficiency or add solar panels. So buying an older home and making it energy efficient um, is not only good for the environment, but it, I think it really represents a cost savings and energy savings versus tearing down that house and building new construction. So not only do you have the embodied energy, but you also have the transportation energy, the energy it takes to go from that place to somewhere else on a day-to-day -day basis. And the, whole, the historic housing stock of our city tends to be in the urban core, in a more walkable environment, so you save energy in terms of the distance that you have to travel. But to tear that house down, and to build something new. I mean, you're losing a tremendous amount of, of embedded energy, and there are ways of calculating how much energy it took to build uh, pre or post war pre, pre or post war home and be able to calculate that against new construction. And in, in most cases, if you adaptively reuse and save a building, you're looking at a 10 to 80 year energy savings over, uh, over building something brand new because of the energy that would be lost versus trying to adaptively retrofit it. Right, interesting. Well, so let's talk about the difference between like an old and a historic building, and then where is that line when it's not worth restoring an old building? Well, that's I mean that's sort of an interesting that's sort of an interesting question. I mean, where that line is is really up to, to an, an individual or to a policy or a policy position. I mean, most buildings in our community really have an opportunity to be retro, retrofitted and, and restored. I mean, the adobe buildings, which tend to be vernacular, you know, they use local craftsmanship and really represent a, a reinvestment into our I think our core values as a community. Um, you know, if a building is, I mean, our, our city has sort of an amazing track record of, of saving buildings that would otherwise be thought that they couldn't be saved. The Cheney House on, on Main Avenue is a perfect example of that. The home um, was burnt out just really to a shell and sat rotting for um, over a decade. And uh, a private property owner purchased the building um, and hired um, a, a contractor, Michael Keith, 
um, to, to, re, to rebuild that building from the ground up. And today it's a, a stunning example of the mission revival style designed by David Holmes, who was an important architect in our community. So although sometimes we look at buildings and we say, oh, well, they're, they're, they're far past, we should just tear them down. Um, if that was the mentality, places like the Barrio Viejo, which is one of the most celebrated parts of our community, um, would be completely gone. Mm. Um, but it, it really took sort of foresight in saying, wow, this is architecture that really matters, and how can we make it work and make it more energy efficient um, in our extreme climates? Well, let's compare Tucson to other places like L.A. Uh, I was recently there. I was amazed with the downtown area. Yeah, so L.A. has, downtown Los Angeles has really begun to transform. Um, they started with uh, some new urban policy to really look at the, uh, how to adaptively reuse um, some of their older building stock, their warehouses, their um, commercial buildings, um, and they really cleared the way um, for a tremendous reinvestment. And, and over 60 buildings um, in the last few years have been restored. I mean, massive buildings have been restored and converted into lofts and condos. And new, and new commercial spaces. Um, and now um, Los Angeles has adopted a, uh, a, a, a rehabilitation um, uh, ordinance, an adaptive reuse ordinance that is really clearing the way for um, transformation of their downtown. I think there are lessons to be learned that we could apply to our community and how to reactivate some of our, um, some of our historic building stock, particularly warehouses um, that are vacant or empty or underutilized, uh, making them a, an important part of the urban fabric again. So I think looking to other communities to find solutions is, is really key and important. Is Tucson leading other communities in any way? Um, I, think, I think Tucson is sort of at a crossroads where we have this great opportunity to begin to lead the way. Um, I mean, f f um, one of the places that people can go to to find information about the easiest and best ways to green retrofit their home is to go to um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation Green Lab um, online, um, which will provide all sorts of um, uh, models and examples of, of easy retrofits um, for your home. Um, re the Green Lab actually has looked at Phoenix as a, as a model and really started to address some of the housing stock in Phoenix, and I think there are lessons to be learned in Tucson. Um, Tucson has some progressive um, green policies. Certainly our water harvesting policies um, are, are really leading the nation, um, but I think we can always improve and uh, we can really leverage our, our post-war housing stock and our pre-war housing stock and make clear the way with policy to make it easier to retrofit. Okay, sounds good. All right, so Green Lab. I'm going to have Green to Lab. check that yeah, out. National Trust for Historic Preservation, Green Lab. All right, sounds good. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. The final month of the year is just beginning, and while many people are thinking about the holidays or the new year, December is also a great time to explore the beauty and variety of our natural world. Next, we take you to the Sonoran Desert in December to tell you what you can expect this time of year in our great outdoors. This segment is produced by Tom Clasby. Hello. I am Jesus Garcia in the aviary at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. As winter moves into the Sonoran Desert, one of the notable changes is the increase in the number of visitors. Some arrive on wheels, driving RVs, and others fly in with no luggage from faraway places. The latter are our migratory feather friends who make for a great winter spectacle in the Sonoran Desert. These visitors range from the largest hawk in North America, the ferruginous hawk, to some of the smallest birds in the world, hummingbirds. Our mild winter provides a great temporary home for these and many other flocks from the north, such as the charismatic sandhill cranes visiting southern Arizona every year. At the same time, many species of birds actually leave the Sonoran Desert in the winter. Sometimes we don't realize that the white-winged dove and the barn swallows have left for warmer lands down south into Mexico or South America. For all these migrants coming and going on the wing or on the wheel, the Sonoran Desert is an irresistible destination. And that's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, you may visit our website at azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.